All right, all right. Who's happy to be in the house of the Lord today? That was weak. Y'all for real? You, y'all weren't ready for that? You ready to do it again? Who's happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Good. That's better. Don't you hate it when the person tells you to do something twice in the, in the audience? Is that just me? Whenever somebody's like, that wasn't good enough. I'm the person that's like, okay, that's all I got. That's what I gave you. Like when they had a concert and they're like, let's get louder. I'm like, for what? Like I'm, I can hear. Like, I'm, is anybody like that? That's, that's okay. You don't have to say it twice. I apologize. But anyway, we're so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, and I'm so excited about it being February, uh, which usually means love month, right? Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about love. But again, because we got two of these, and I'm still getting used to that, right? Uh, we can split this up into two ways. And so the way we're going to do this is tonight, I- I'm going to talk about what is love. And, and mostly we're going to be talking about God's love and what that love does to us and, and how it shapes us and molds us. And then in two weeks, we're going to talk about relational love, right? Sex, love, dating, relationships, all of that. We're going to be dealing with that in a couple weeks. And I got some really dope news. I'm sorry. Really good news for you guys. Really excited. Next, uh, in two weeks, when we have our next Friday Young Adult, Ramey's going to be doing it with me. Yeah. Very excited. And so we're going to be doing a love thing together uh, and very much looking forward to it. So that's in a couple weeks. We're going to talk about love. We're going to deal with love. Uh, but tonight, I want to define what is love. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's get going. I got a lot to say, and uh, my time's already clicking. You know, they, don't, they start my clock when I get up here. They don't let me do an intro, like say hi to people. I step on the stage. My first step up, they're like, that clock is going. Hurry up. Let's go. Get this sermon finished. Amen. Amen. I understand that. Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're going to start tonight. Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 16 is where we're at. Ephesians 3.16, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Right? So God's spirit is going to strengthen us in our inner being. And I'm excited because last uh, couple weeks ago, we talked about the spirit. Amen? You remember that? Y'all forgot that already a couple weeks ago? The spirit, the move, nah, y'all, it's gone. That's all right, I'll remind you in a second. I'm gonna have to. Okay, I see that. So, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Arrgh, that's good, Paul. That you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you and praise you for your word, which is a lamp into our feet and it's a light into our pathway. And God, as we dive into your word tonight, Lord, I pray again that you give us light. You help us see. Uh, God, we've may have been at services like this and gone to church many times and heard many stories, many sermons on love. But I pray, God, tonight that you will truly uh, cause this word to get into us, Uh, that it not just be words spoken of years ago or even words spoken of by me on a stage, but, God, uh, something that we can take and digest and live our lives on. I pray for strength in that. So, God, that we are rooted and established in love. And that we become those that you're speaking about here in Ephesians 3. That we are those that are filled to the fullness of you because of the love that we have. So God, teach us what love is tonight. And then finally, Lord, I pray that you will speak through me. Not for fame or reputation, but for someone to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, the title of tonight is, is What is Love? Uh, and when I thought of that, my first thought was the song. Come on. What is love? Y'all know that song. Maybe don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. What is love? That's my jam. Right? Oh, 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 oh. Come on, right? Yeah, come on. Oh, oh, oh. I tried it out. That's that jam though, right? Anybody? That's that jam. So what is love was what I first thought of. We was going to put that up on the screens, but the video I sent them was from like 1987. And so they were like, Mike, that's that's too low tech for us. So, you know, you 
<laughs> that's just, this is the, nah, you can't play that. But, you know, there you go. Uh, what is love? And so tonight we're going to talk about what is love. Again, real quick, though, let's, let's review where we are. Uh, because I love that we're progressing somewhere as a people, amen? A and I love that together as a community, we're going somewhere. Uh, last month, we talked about the fire of God, yes? Yes, we first talked about how that fire is a consuming fire that, that should affect every part of our lives. Like the fire of God should affect everything around us. Uh, and then two weeks ago, we went a little deeper. We talked about backdraft. Y'all remember? And maybe in, in, in the spirit moving, and you got to let the spirit in. Y'all starting. I can see the faces like, oh, yeah, that, I was here. I remember that, right? And, and you got to let the wind in, the spirit of God come in. Uh, and we actually looked at three things from last time, and I want to review these quickly because I think they're good, is number one, you got to know your place for the spirit of God to continue to come in uh, and to consume your life. You got to know the place that you play in this thing, meaning he's above and I'm below, right? I, I submit and I listen and I learn and I glean from him. He is above and I, and I gladly sit under him, right? If you don't know your place, you're going to think you can do it on your own. Amen? Uh, the second one is you got to change your mood. We talked about that. Remember, I talked about fix your face and, and how your mood sometimes affects how your spirit is feeling and what the Lord is trying to do. And oftentimes in our lives, we're frustrated by the Spirit, uh, and, and a lot of it is that, that your mood is affected, uh, that you got to change your mood. And so I don't want to start preaching that again because I was about to. And I said, you saw when I started backing up, I was about to preach it again. I'm not doing that, okay? No, you, you, you got you to gotta change your mood. And then the last one, we, we talked about get ready, right? And you got to prepare yourself for what God is doing. And specifically, we talked about a town called Gennesaret. Do you remember that? A town of people that were ready and established to hear what God was doing. They were ready for the spirit to move. Uh, and God blew the wind of, his, of him, and literally Jesus, on a boat. He blew them over to this town, and everybody in that town was affected. And so there is something about the spirit moving. Tonight I want to deal with love, and, and I want to deal and understand the, the kind of basic biblical God definition of what is love. In the passage we just read, it says something really cool about love. It speaks about how we are to be rooted and established in love. And then Paul uses four kind of words to describe this love of God. And I think it's really dope. The first one he says is that the love of God is wide. And I think that the first way you're going to define God's love is that it's wide enough for everyone. I think if you're going to begin defining the love of God, it begins with knowing that it's not just about you, Arr, right? Like, like you got to grasp that, that his love is about us, not necessarily about me. And so he does care about you, but he cares about you in, in the full essence of, of the us that he cares for all of us. Uh, he doesn't start caring for you when you start caring for him. It's not the way he works. He doesn't start loving you when you do good things. No, God's love for us is for everyone right now. He loves everyone on this earth equally as he loves you. And I think that's important for us to grasp the love of God because as Christians, we, we, we tend to believe after some time that God really loves us a little different than them, right? Like, like he loves me and he cares about me. And you know what? I, I, I'm with you. He does. But to grasp the fullness of his love, you got to realize that it's for everyone. It's wide enough for all. Then it says the, the love of God is, is long. I love that. Uh, and when I think of the love of God being long, it's, it's that it always was, it always is, and it always will be. His love is lengthy. I love that, right? It, it, it's, it never, start, there was no starting point and there's no ending point. It always was and always is. I like to think of God in terms of time more like a circle than a line. And we've talked about that before, right? Where God's love is, is more circular. There's no beginning. There's no end. It's just everlasting and constant. And his love for us lasts that long. And that means his love for you doesn't end when you make a mistake. And his love for you is not even dependent on your life for him. Your love for him is, is always there. It always will be. And it's strong enough to keep you even through the hard times. The third word that's used to describe, and I like this one, is it says his love is high, Right? It's high. And what's dope about the love of God being high is that it's above me. It's, it's to be honored. It's to be respected. It's to be worshiped. That there is something about his love that puts me in my place. Amen? 
Like, like, like you're challenged and changed when you realize the love that he has for you. And his love for you puts you in a place where I say, your love is so good that I have to worship it. I honor it. And so it's high above me. I think the worst thing that can happen in love is that love becomes too familiar. You ever had a friend that's a little too familiar oh, and, and they just be like coming in your house? I, I, we had a person in our house when, when, <laughs> when somebody's already getting where I'm going. Come on, don't laugh yet. You're, you're ahead of everybody. So no, uh, but I had, we, were, we had a house. My dad was, it was open. You know, people come over and bless you and then I'm a pastor and praise the Lord. And, and it was like, that's a beautiful thing. And then we had like a woman from the church that would just like come by and she would just come in. And it's like, we love you, but that's too familiar, baby. Like, like, we don't love you that deep. Like, you just show up at the crib. I didn't invite you. And what you doing here? And we were his kids. And so we were like, my dad's nice. We're not. Like, right? Like, like, my dad would pray with you and sit with you. We're like, get out. What you doing in my house? But, but, but his love, in, in terms of his highness, is that uh, it deserves our honor. It deserves our honor and, and our homage. We should give God everything. And then the last one is, is that his love is deep. His love is deep. And what I love about the depth of his love is that it touches even my emotions. Let's, let's consider how high and mighty God is and then how deep he is that he cares about how I feel. Arr. That, that he's the creator of the universe and a universe that's ever expanding that even scientists cannot know the beginning part or where it ends. It's an everlasting constant number of always increasing God's size of, his, of who he is is so vast yet he cares about you and your mind and what you're going through and how you feel. His love is deep. And so I love that Paul uses these four ways to really describe the love of God. Unfortunately, it's very difficult, however, in our world to then just define love, uh, especially because we live in a world where people think that love is kind of whatever they feel. Like, like love is dictated by kind of what happens to you. And so you'll have somebody that says, uh, love is whatever I feel it to be. Uh, or you'll have somebody say this silly statement, I fell in love. Like, oops, I tripped. Oh, some, y'all were quiet on that. Y'all use that. Y'all use that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. But it's, love is not something you oops and trip into. Right? It ain't like I saw him and it was love at first sight. Look, look. So we get confused at what love is. You don't stumble upon it. It's something much deeper than that. If we have somebody that says, this, says things like this, I, I can't fight love, right? I can't do it. I say, I, it's just what I feel. What do you want me to do? I love him. <laughs> how, how do you expect me to go on? I'm in love. And, and, and so we get a confused idea of what love is, especially in our world, which, which thinks that love is kind of whatever makes them feel good for that moment uh, or, or makes them feel good in that second. I was watching a show a little while ago, uh, and every time I do this example, I, I need to come up with a better one, but there is no better one, right? I was watching Maury Povich, right? Uh, Ma Maury, you know, anybody watch Maury? Yeah, Maury, Maury, no. I've seen Maury Povich like six times in my life, okay? But this is one of the times I've watched it. And in this episode, this guy was married to a horse. True story. And he brought a horse on stage, and he was like, this is who I love. And everybody in the audience looked like, yo, like, yo, you're crazy. Like, not only do you love a horse, that's one thing. You brought it here, like, right? Like, did you travel together? Like, <laughs> how'd y'all get here? Was there a state, like, do y'all stay at a stable or hotel? Like, how y'all travel? That's my, that was my question. What's new? When you leave here, where you go? You walk it? Like, you walk your boo? Come on. That's different. It's different. And, and everybody was confused like you guys are. And, and he made a statement and it shut the whole room down. He says, you can't tell me what love is. And everybody said, yeah. <laughs> because in our world, it's very difficult to understand what love is, especially when love changes based on your emotions or, or based on what's happening or, or based on what you feel is right for you in the situation that you're in. 
And it's one of the reasons why in order to truly grasp love, and it's what we're gonna deal with in a couple weeks with relationships and, and love and marriage, before we even get into that, you gotta understand the basic understanding of who God is and what love is. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 1 John chapter four, verse seven. It says, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And then it says this statement. It says, whoever does not know, love God, whoever does not love God, wait, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, there's a lot of things that God acts like. There's a lot of attributes in the Bible. In fact, uh, there are hundreds of them in terms of ways that God is described and, and who he is and how he acts. And, and throughout our lives with him, we're gonna be trying to figure out all that God is. And so I can't sit up here and tell you, I can explain to you everything that God is. But I will say this, there are very few things that are said in scripture that God doesn't act like it's who he is. God is love. God doesn't act loving. He doesn't try to love you. He is the embodiment of love. And so what that means is, is that in order to understand love, you got to understand God. And in order to truly grasp God, love is needed to, to, to understand all that it entails in that. And so it's very difficult to define love without him because it's who he is. It's not what he acts like. It's who he's defined as. And so tonight, I, I want to give you a couple things of what is love. Like if I were to give a, a list of what love is, this, this is where the list would begin. Number one, if I were to define love for you, uh, love is number one, sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. Love is giving of yourself for other. And, and I think that that definition of love is a definition that most people can agree with. And we see sacrificial love as love. And I don't think anybody questions that, right? The, the, the firefighters and the first responders, for example, that ran into uh, the buildings at 9-11, right? When, when the World Trade Centers were falling down, you had firemen and policemen that were running into the building to save people and, and knew based on what was happening that maybe their life was in jeopardy. And, and I don't think anybody would look at that and say, well, that's not really true love. Like, like sacrificial love, I think, hits all of us in a deep way because it's giving of yourself for other, right? It's, it's not thinking first of you, but thinking of other over self. And I think that's, that's a great place to start with the love of God. And what I love about God is that his love is what first defines sacrifice for us. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died. So God sacrificed himself for people that didn't even love him. His sacrifice began before he was loved. And it's what defines true love in our lives. Love is sacrifice. Love is, is something that you give of yourself. It's why we get frustrated in love when it feels like uh, it's, it's attacking or, or, or it doesn't do that. Or if you get around somebody that's very selfish, it's hard to see that they love, amen, right? You have a friend that's very selfish, you know, family members that just struggle in that, and you feel based on that that they're not being loving to you. Because without sacrifice, it's, it's difficult to really grasp that, that truth of his love. That while we were sinners, Christ died. And so what I love about God is that God never asks us to do something that he hasn't already done first. It's one of the coolest attributes of God that there is, is that he's not the type of leader that says, do what I say, not what I do. He, he's the type of God, the type of leader. He, he is who he is to say, look, look, I will show you first how it's done. And all I'm asking for you to do is to do what I did. And you have to remember that he starts his love for us with sacrifice. Like, like his love for us begins with sacrifice. And that sacrifice, again, is not based on what you've done well because it says while you were sinners, he died. 
It's really based on a love he has for you that's intrinsic, a a love that's just in you because you were made by him and he loves you and he cares about you and he sacrificed his life for people that didn't even want him to do that. He sacrificed his life for the person that killed him. In fact, one of the most miraculous stories of Jesus is that the men that gathered around to kill Jesus, many of them were shaked and, and moved by his experiences. There's a story of the centurion that stabbed him in the side that was the final piece, kind of, if you will, to, to, to the end of him where he was pierced in his side. And, and as that blood trickled down, the story says that in church history, that man was never the same. That, 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 that all the men that gathered around that were trying to kill him were affected by it because his sacrificial love does something. And so I would say to you, much like what he does, we must start our love for him with sacrifice. If we're struggling in love, it's usually because we're struggling in sacrifice. It's not costing you something. Uh, And so the love of God should take your time, right? The love of God should take you away from being comfortable. And so if any of the reasons why we walk away from the love of God is, is around that, it's, it's the wrong way because it should cost you something. It, it should feel sacrificial. It should feel like it's weighty and it means something. And I think that that's what makes his love real. And anybody who has ever been in a relationship, just because you have great feelings for him, doesn't mean that that relationship's gonna go great. I mean, don't you wish that if you just really like someone, then that's it, and you guys don't fight because you really like them, and you fall in love, and now we're married, and so why are we fighting? We love each other. Oops, upside your head. That ain't how it works, right? And in the same way, God says, I sacrifice, you sacrifice, and that begins our process of love together. And then now let's work, and it should cost you something because it cost him something, right? And how dare we look at God who sacrificed his son for us and yet not be willing to sacrifice anything for that love in our lives. Love has to be sacrificial. The second thing that love is, and, and I think, again, this one, uh, this one is, is, is a little, little interesting, right? I, I believe that love is truth. Love is truth. And the reason I say that is is because I believe that most relationships, and if we were to be totally honest, most relationships end because of lack of truth. Can we agree with that? Right? A lack of of truth in what's happening. Uh, There's there's either one or more parties that are struggling in the truth department. And I'll say both parties, right? Uh, Remembering, of course, that when relationship ends, most of the times it's both people, not one. And so there is sometimes a lack of truth. And I'm not saying that you're a liar. I'm just saying that sometimes we don't know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, then then a lot of times you come off as lying or you come off as, as arrogant or you come off as a certain way, but really it's because you really just don't understand that truth. Uh, and so we got to understand uh, what this whole truth thing is about. Now, now let me give you the world's definition of truth. And to the world, the truth is whatever is right for them and whatever works for them. And so for, for them, truth is what's working and what's right for me. And, and whatever I feel is right for me is my truth. And, and you'll hear somebody say that. They'll say, well, my truth is what I feel and, and kind of what's going on in them. And it's very difficult to, to then understand God's love uh, because if it's defined by your truth, well, what if your truth is apart from his feelings for you? And so we have people that struggle in this and they believe that truth is defined by their love. So, so, so what's true is the love that I have. And so they'll say, I must have, this must be honest and real and true because I love them. And because I have love for this person, uh, this woman, this man, then, then it's real, it's true, it's, it's meaningful. And I would say that, that, that unfortunately, uh, God sees things a little bit differently. Uh, let, let me help you understand how God sees truth. In fact, in God's definition of love, uh, he, he starts with this statement that's found in John 14, 5. He says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. That, that in order, or I'm the light, that in order for me, in order for you to come to a place uh, of knowing him, you got to realize that he is the truth, that, that he defines your truth. 
And so for, for us, we need to see that love is defined uh, again by truth. That, that the love of God is, is what helps me to define what's happening in the rest of me. And then realizing that God's love is the only true love that exists. And so starting with his love, you can start to formulate what you should look for in love. It's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to give relationship advice to people that, that, that are Christian and dating somebody that's not. It's, it's a very difficult thing. Now, I've done it many, many times. And I'm not telling you it's impossible. I, I will tell you this. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> Amen. You can clap for that. Amen. It's very difficult. And it's because you're trying to define a truth that they might not see. And the life that you're living for God, the love that you have for him, again, it's not, it's not based on feeling. It's based on him. It's not based on how well it's going or, or how good you are, or how good he is. or how. No, no, no. It's based on a, a situation in which God's in control and I'm under him. And so we have to let the truth be that God defines love, not me. Your truth has to be that before I jump into love, I have to submit my love to God. And that's the truth. That, that, that's where we have to be. And that we have to see that, that the truth of God is what dictates our love life, not the other way around. That, that you fall in love and then you hope it's real and true. No, God says, first submit it to me and I will help you walk into the truth. Why? Because I am the truth. I'm the one who can see it. I'm the one who knows the way. And so again, we got to submit that to God. And then finally, number three, love is giving. Love is giving. I think on the basic level, love is the desire to give. And on a very basic level, you can write this down. I don't have it on my notes, but the opposite is lust. And lust is the desire to take. And it's very basic when you can look and say, is this relationship a lust relationship or a love relationship? I would ask you one question. Are you giving or are you taking? I mean, lust takes what's not yours. And so the reason that you're having premarital sex is because you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. And so that's lust. I, I don't care what you're saying. I don't care what you think. It's lust because it's not yours and you're taking. Whereas love would say, I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to sacrifice feelings. I'm going to sacrifice what I want right now. I, I know I want to go deeper. I know we want to take that next level, but I'm going to sacrifice that because love is a giving thing. I have to give of myself and not just expect in terms of there being love. Best passage that I, that I love for that, of course, is, and you know it well, is John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he what? That he gave. And so it's out of his love for us that he gives. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Meaning that if you have true love, then you should be giving. It should be something where you're looking to give, not looking to get or looking to receive. In fact, in, in Hebrew, the word for love is, is the word ahava. Everyone say ahava. It's a really cool word. It's, it's the Hebrew word for love, uh, but, but, but it's split up into three ways. And, and, and this is how it was originally taught to me. And this is really cool. Uh, they, we, the, the ancient Jews believed that, that when God created the world and, and he looked on to Adam, uh, that he did something. He was standing over a lifeless body of Adam. And what he did was that he breathed into him, right? The Bible says he breathed into his nostrils or he breathed into him the breath of life. Well, what happened in that moment is that I believe that God breathed and, and that word he made was, was the ah. And so everybody say ah. And if actually, if you put your hand in front of your mouth and say ah, you'll feel that there's air coming out, right? You're, you're hitting that. It's this, it's this sound, right, that's hitting it. It's ah. And that was God. God breathed into Adam. God breathes into us and he says ah. Then the second part of it, and, and this is again ah, God breathing out, is that then there is the ha, right? Uh, and the ha in Hebrew is more than just the word ha. It's, it's, it was a breath in. And so the belief is that God said ah into Adam and Adam said ah. You hear that? So instead of it saying aha, it was more like ah. Makes sense? 
And so the second part is that God breathed first and then we breathed it in. And then the last word is va. And that word va is that love was given. And it's so cool. And so the idea is that God breathed, we breathed, and love came. In fact, I believe that what God breathed into us was love. It wasn't breath. It wasn't oxygen. It was love. Love was breathed into them. So instead of saying ahava, really it's ahava. Because God did something and then we reacted to it and all of that means that I'll give. In fact, in Hebrew, the literal word for ahava, it means I will give. And so the word for love is the same as the word for I will give. Because to God, loving is this giving sacrifice that he does for you. It cost him something. It should cost you something. Now, I'm going to close with this, and and, and I've done this before. Uh, It's been a while, and so most of the people in this room, you've probably never heard me do this, but but I'm going to do it again. Now, if you've heard me teach this, please don't give the answer away to the people that are around you. Don't be one of them like, I know this. Watch what what he's about to do here. Don't tell the person if you know where we're going. Uh, But but I I want to leave you with, with this statement, with this question. The question I have is, why were we made? Why did God place us on this earth? What was the reason that he made you? What's the point of humanity, right? What was the point of God making man? It's a great question. And what I'm gonna give you is I'm gonna give you three traditional answers. And the reason I call them traditional is because these are the answers that I was given in church growing up. And when I would go to people and I had those questions and I would say, well, what was the point of us? What's the point of me? Uh, These were the answers uh, that I was traditionally given in church. The first answer is why we were made is that God was lonely. He was lonely. And out of his loneliness, he he wanted relationship with us, right? And so he didn't want to just be God sitting up there alone, doing nothing, twiddling his God thumbs, right? He he was lonely and, and he craved relationship. Anybody ever heard that before, that, that there was like a lonely idea of God? Now, this is kind of dated because old hymns actually sing this. And this is why it was kind of told us in church that, that kind of out of his loneliness, he made us. I'll give you one passage that dispels that very quickly. The Bible says uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. And right from the beginning, God is trying to tell you that I, don't, I didn't make you because I needed love. I already had it. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. There was love before you. Love didn't start when you got on this earth. Love came before. And in the same way, God didn't make us because he was lonely. He already had love and he already had relationship before us. So that can't be the answer. The second answer that most people give is that God made us to serve him. Now, who here has ever heard that in church before? That we were created to serve him and that we honor him with our lives. Now, now again, I don't want to rip this too deep, right? I don't want to go too far because I don't want to mess with some of your Sunday school teachings that you might have had growing up. But, but I will say this, that, that the idea that God created people to be new servants for him is, is, is a little difficult to, to, to go all the way through with. And there are people that struggle with the idea of God because they're saying, well, why would he make servants to just serve him? Is that really the extent of him? It almost seems like he's, like he's insecure, like he needs somebody to, to kind of do his bidding for him. And this is what an atheist would kind of say. And, and it's because that, that idea is linked with something that's incorrect. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 25, it says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. Guys, the temples made were not for God, it's for us to worship him in there. He doesn't need the church to come down to be, to be a, a part of us. Look at verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. God's not a dictator that created servants to, to come do his bidding or to just fall down and do everything he says. That's not the idea. He didn't make you so that you can serve him. 
It's not why he put you on this earth. Now I will say this, when you truly love him, you will love to serve, amen? And, and so service is not a bad thing. I, I'm serving God when I'm standing in front of you, right? There's, there's a service in all of us that's healthy and good, but that's not why he put you on this earth. It's just something that you're supposed to do. Now here's the last one, the third one. And, and, and I get in trouble every time I teach this because uh, most of us in this room were taught this answer. The number one answer that most people give as to why we were made is to worship Him. Now raise your hand if you've ever heard that in church. Come on, right? We were made to worship Him. We were created, put on this earth to worship Him. Now again, before I rip that apart, let me say something. Let me give you a disclaimer, and this is real. There is nothing higher that you can do in your life than worshiping God. It, it, it is the highest thing you can do. I, I think it, 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 is, it is a high that goes beyond any earthly high because it doesn't need more of that to keep going. Arr. The love of God is eternal. It's something that's awesome. And so worshiping him does become everything you are. It, it almost seems like it's what defines me. However, that's not the reason he puts you on this earth. In Revelation chapter four, verse eight, it says this, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 40. It says, I tell you, he replied, if you keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What I would tell you right now is that if every single person on earth stopped worshiping him, God would still get worshiped. Bible says that if all of us all at once shut up, the rocks would start to scream out his praises. And so he doesn't need our praise to be who he is. In fact, right now there's 24 elders that are walking around following him singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In fact, what happens in worship service is that we actually join in with what's already happening in heaven. We're not creating something new. We're not trying to conjure up the spirit here. We're connecting to what's already happening up in heaven. Worship is happening right now and in a couple minutes, we're gonna tune in to the worship radio station of heaven and join in with what we'll be doing for the rest of eternity. It's dope, right? But that's not why he made you. It's not why he made you. And, and so why were we made? And I think that's, that's kind of, I, I left you more confused, right? Like, like <laughs> you're not closer to the answer. I almost feel like I've pulled you farther away from the answer. Well, let, let me help you. Let me bring it a little closer for you. And let me show you a passage of scripture that's really huge. Now, this is a passage of scripture that is found in Acts, but it's a quote of Jesus. Very few quotes of Jesus in other books of the Bible other than the Gospels. Acts has this one quote. Revelation, of course, has some. Uh, and then there are other times in Scripture where we quote Jesus. But this is a quote of Jesus in the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so guys, hear me. And in fact, this statement is, is a difficult statement. I actually put it up and I want you to write this statement down. It's already there in your notes. But, but I would say this way, any reason that we give as to why we were made that centers around what God gets rather than what God gives is the wrong answer. If it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, that means that the reason he made you has nothing to do with what he gets from you. Ugh. He didn't make you to serve him. He didn't make you to worship him. He didn't make you because he was lonely and he needed something from you. He made you because of something that he wants to give to you. He made you so that he can give you love. The reason you were placed on this earth is that he wanted another creature to experience his love on earth. It means that much. It, it, it shapes and changes you that much because when you realize you're loved, it changes everything about you. And so you were placed on this earth not for what he gets from you, but what he wants to give to you. 
He loves you that deeply. C.S. Lewis put it this way. It says, we were not made primarily that we may love God, though we were made for that too. And I don't want you to miss that. Loving God is dope and it's the greatest thing in the world, but that's not we were made. But that God may love us, that we may become objects in which divine love may rest well pleased. He made you to love you because he cares about you that much. Here's the last one. C.S. Lewis says, God loves us, not because we are lovable, but because he is love. And he doesn't love you because you deserve it. He loves you because that's who he is. And it's all he is. It's what he does. Not because he needs to receive, but because he delights to give. Tonight, I wanted to present to you the idea that in order to grasp any love in this world, you have to first grasp that you are loved. And when you know you're loved, it changes you. It shapes how you act, it shapes how you live, it shapes how you talk and, and how you walk. It, it shapes everything about you. I remember when I was in high school and, and I found out that a girl that I thought was cute liked me. Not gonna lie to y'all, it did something for me. Now when I walk by that girl, I walked a little different. I used to just walk by like, hello, how you doing? Well, welcome to school, right? But when I found out she was feeling me, now I'm walking by like, hey girl, what's up? Hey, hey what up? how you doing? It's a little different. Now, even if the person that likes you is not all that cute, you still like it. Come on, somebody, right? You're still flattered when you find out somebody likes you because it's better to be liked by somebody ugly than not liked at all. Come on, right? Can we be real? If nobody thinks you're cute, it's better than somebody thinks you're cute. But when you know you're loved, it changes how you talk around that person, how you are around that person. And in the same way, when you come to a realization of his love for you, it changes you. It changes how you live and how you act and how you move. When you realize that you're loved, not for what you give, but for what he wants to give to you, it changes you. And so when you fully embrace the love of God that he has for you, I pray that it will radically change you. Bow your head, close your eyes, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you and I praise you that your love for us is so wide. It reaches everyone. God, your love for us is, is so long. It always was, it always is, and it always will be, it's lengthy. God, that your love is high. It's above me, it's, it's rooted in, in this kingdom, it's rooted in something deep, but, but it's high and lofty, it's to be esteemed and worshiped, and it calls for my reverence, it causes for my holiness, it calls for my sacrifice. It's high above me, and I honor it. And then finally, Lord, I thank you that your love for me is deep. That God, you care about our individual needs. That, that you're not so high above it all that you're just mad that we don't or aren't being what you want us to be. No, your love for us chases us down. It fights for us. Your love goes out of its way to reveal who you want us to be. God, I pray that we were totally changed and shaped by the love that you have for us. You know, while I'm, I'm praying, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that I, I do feel uh, like there are some people in this room that, that, that need that. So what I wanna do is I, I wanna do a prayer for, for anybody that feels that they've, they, they've been hurt by love. L love is something that's difficult. Love, love is hard. Maybe it's something that you've gone through. Maybe it's something that you're going through and you're in it now, but, but it's hard for you to see God's love mostly because of, of human love. And if that's you, I just wanna pray for you. I just want you to throw your hand up and pull it down. I wanna pray for you. Just put it up, pull it down. That's all I want you to do. Just acknowledge I need prayer, Pastor Mike, that's me. I'm somebody that struggles in love. I'm somebody that is, it's, it's hard for me to grasp that. If that's you, cool, just put your hand up pull it down. Amen. Amen. Well, right now all over this room, I just want to pray. And if, and if this is you, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, 
In fact, why don't we all say it so the people who are, who are specific don't feel left, don't feel kind of secluded. So let, let's all pray this together. Just say, Father, Father, I give you myself. And I pray, God, that you will teach me how to love you the way you love me. I, I want to be changed by your love. I don't want to be the same anymore. So remake me, Lord, just like you, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that, that might struggle in love. God, we know that, that love's a difficult thing, especially when in our lives we might have raised and, and struggled with understanding and, and, and the fullness of what love is. But God, I thank you that, that you have given us this, this perfect demonstration of love and that while we were sinners, you died, you sacrificed yourself, you gave of yourself. And so I pray, God, that you will cause us all to be those that give of ourselves as well. Continue to shape us into what you want us to be. Not our will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love y'all.